Good morning, everyone. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We have this Sunday, this morning, and next Sunday to finish the parables about the mysteries of the kingdom. And this morning, we're going to have a, a very quick review. I have a number of charts and hopefully everybody will be able to see them clearly. We've already covered the parable of the sower, and I'm just going to put a chart up here and ask you regarding the parable of the sower and regarding the postponement period, where did we discuss is the possible place where the parable of the sower would be seen on this time chart. Whoops, how do I go back? That way. Where would it go? I give, let's see, who, who wants to put it out with a, a laser? Ben does. All right, Ben does. Don't get too close to Alan, he's like a cat, he'll chase that. And there are other people, dispensations, that would go further on, but I think the context would teach us that it is more than likely shortly after the Lord Jesus announces the postponement period. We're going to quickly go through the wheat and the tares. Jesus explains the parable. In Matthew 13, we're going to look at verses 36 through 44, 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Now we're going to ask the question, where, this should be easy. Who wants to point it out, Kevin? No, no. Who wants to point it out? Somebody here. Josh does. Where are we going to find parables of the wheat and the tares? And that text that we just read gives us an indication as to where. That's right, at the very end of the age. Thank you. Thank you. So what can we say about the first parable? It represents the beginning of the postponement period. And the second parable represents the end of the postponement period. And how many parables did Jesus explain? Just these two. They're the only ones. So, we move on. We have the postponement period. And there's a reason I brought this up because in the past, I didn't have the rapture in there. It's important for us to see the time frame of what's happening. So, we have the parable of the sowers in the beginning here, and we have the wheat and the tares here. The church is raptured here. So we're going to find out that a lot of the parables, I believe, deal with this particular part of the postponement period. And what's interesting, although the postponement period was a mystery to the disciples, According to the Old Testament scriptures, was the 70th week of Daniel a mystery? The 70th week of Daniel was not a mystery, so they should have known that that period of time was going to come. So as we continue on looking at these parables, 
There's some things that we see in the parable of the wheat and the tares. There are no angels involved in the rapture. That passage we just read has angels involved, doesn't it? There's no judgment of the saved and the unsaved. And here's a reason why I bring this up. Because at the rapture, who's involved? Just the church. They're all saved. But the end of the age involves both the saved and the unsaved being judged. We're going to look at some passages that deal with that. But in what way is there a judgment of the saved and the unsaved at the end of the days, at the end of the age? It's, say it again? Uh, no, not there. Not there yet. I have another, another chart to deal with that. It's a separation of the saved from the unsaved. Because what we have to remember, at the end of the age, at the end of the seventh week of Daniel, which is also the tribulation period, everybody who is judged is still alive physically. They're still in their mortal bodies. And the saved people, what happens to them? They go into the kingdom of God with mortal bodies able to have children. It's the unsaved people that have survived the tribulation period that are separated from the saved, and those unsaved people go into outer darkness, the furnace of fire, where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Is everybody with me so far? So we have to understand that. This, these parables that are dealing with the end of the age are dealing with the end of the tribulation period, where people are still in their physical, mortal bodies, able to bleed, able to breathe, able to have children, the saved go into the eternal kingdom, or in, in, into the millennial kingdom, but the unsaved are cast into hell. So this parable doesn't describe the rapture, but it does describe the end of the 70th week of Daniel, which is also called the seven-year tribulation period, which is also called the time of great Jacob's trouble. That's right. There's three different titles that we can use for that. So only the saved are involved in the rapture, but at the end of the age, there'll be the saved and the unsaved with mortal bodies still able to reproduce. Now, this first separation we see in Matthew chapter 21, verses 31 through 46, Matthew uh, 25, I'm sorry. We're not going to go there right now. But we see a separation of the saved from the unsaved in this parable in Matthew 21. And it's, it's just, it really, it flows in with the parables of Matthew 13. In fact, let's go there, Matthew 25. Matthew 25. beginning in verse 31. And I want you to keep in mind some of the things that we see that are similar to the parable of the tares. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His what? Holy angels with Him. Then when He sit on the throne of His glory, all nations will be gathered before Him and He will, what's the next word? Separate. Keep that in mind because isn't that what happens with the wheat and the tares? There's a separation from the wheat and the tares. We're going to look at the parable of the dragnet here in a moment. And there's also a separation of the good and the bad. He'll separate them one from another. And as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So what do we see here? At the end of the age, the truly saved, who are still in their mortal bodies, will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. But what about the next group? Verse 41. Then it will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into what? Everlasting fire. Have we seen this in the parable of the wheat and the tares? They're thrown into what? furnace of fire. So we see this is the same time period. 
the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the end of the tribulation period, or the 70th week of Daniel. Now, I have another slide here, because I don't want us to be confused about the judgments. I know there might have been a little confusion last week. So, the church is raptured here before the 70th week of Daniel begins. Is there a judgment per se for Christians? What, what's it called? The vain seat, the judgment seat of Christ. There's no loss of salvation there. There can be loss of reward, but there's no loss of salvation. Then we have the second coming. And this is what we've been talking about here. So the wheat and the tares would be here. Matthew 25 that we just read would be here. And those people are ones who have survived the tribulation period. They're still in their mortal body. And just so we have clarification, then after the kingdom runs its 1,000 year reign, we get to the end of the 1,000 year reign, and then we have what? The great white throne judgment. So we have a number of judgments here. What happens to the church, the rapture, that's the judgment seat of Christ. What happens at the second coming? These deal with a lot of the parables in Matthew 13. And then what we have here at the very end of the London Kingdom, the great white throne judgment. And that's the last judgment. Because after that we go into the eternal state, and whatever's going to happen, happens then. No, no other individuals are getting saved after the great white throne judgment when we go into the eternal state. Is everybody with me? Now, do people die during the millennial kingdom? There will, it will be a rare thing, but if someone dies at 100, it'll be like he's a child. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing what the scripture says. Right. No. So it's not going to be a common thing. People will live for a long period of time. Right? Many, of the, many parts of the curse have been lifted at that point. So let's continue on. Scott? Yes. Do we get a new body when the rapture happens? You better believe it. Okay. All right? We will. And in a sense, the rapture, it's a unique resurrection. It's, it's all its own thing. Because unlike the other resurrections, which always the resurrection of the dead, the rapture includes a changing of those that are still living and the resurrection of the dead. And that's why it's a mystery, because that was not known in the Old Testament. Okay? So during the rapture, people that are saved are not going to see the new woman? We'll come back no, right. no. Just think of it this way. <clears throat> when we are raised and we meet the Lord for in the clouds, it says, and so shall we ever, what? Be with the Lord. You're not going to get away from the Lord. You're going to be with Him. It's, it's, it, it, every true believer at the moment of the rapture is going to be with the Lord forever and ever. So we're going to be into, well, I have the chart moved. We're going to be into the millennial kingdom and the eternal stage. Once we're with the Lord at the rapture, we're always going to be with Him. Amen? All right, good. So, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Will people get saved after we're gone? You, know, you better believe. We're going to talk about that in a moment. That's the last, that's the very last parable we'll look at today. So now we're going to look at the parable of the dragnet. And what's interesting about this parable, is there's a lot of similarities between the parable of the dragnet and the parable of the wheat and the tares. Some actions are very, very similar. Look at verse 47 of Matthew 13. 47. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Would the disciples have known what a dragnet was? Of course. There's no illustration here that Jesus is using that's not from everyday life that these disciples would have known exactly what he was talking about. And many of the disciples are fishermen, so they would have known exactly what he was mentioning. So again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind. So we already know there's going to be different kinds in this parable. We're going to see two groups. And it's going to be two kinds of what? Dragnets catch what? Fish, two kinds of fish. And when I go fishing, sometimes I catch fish that are good to eat, and sometimes I catch fish that are bad to eat. And I throw the bad ones into Alan's cooler? No, no. 
Just making sure Alan's with us. <laughs> I guess they could be. But the good ones I want to keep, the bad ones I throw away. So we're going to see the separation of good and bad in this parable as well. Look at verse 48. So after they threw out the dragnet, verse 48, which when it was full they drew to shore, and they sat down and gathered the what? The good into vassals, right? But they threw the bad away. Again, the disciples would have been very familiar with this process of separating the good from the bad. The good from the bad. Here's a physical illustration the disciples have put before them, and it leads to and gives an illustration of what's going to happen at the end of the age. Now look at verse 49. So it will be when, at the end of the age, the angels will come forth. Wait a minute, have we seen this before? The end of the age we've seen before? The angels we have seen before? They'll, the angels will come forth and what? Separate, have we seen this before? Yes, the wicked from among the just. So we've seen the phrase, the end of the age. We see that again. We see angels being involved in gathering again. And we see two groups of people again, the wicked and the just. Now verse 50. And cast them into the furnace of fire. There'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now let's compare these parables. And this is pretty simple to see. Hopefully maybe we can see it. Look at how many things each parable has in common. The wheat and the tares have bad tares. Dragon has good fish and bad fish. So we have the harvest and we have the gathered into the net. The tares are burned to the fire. The bad fish are thrown away. We have the end of the age repeated. Angels gathering repeated. And then it says regarding the wheat and the tares, they will gather out of his kingdom all that offend in those who practice lawlessness. And then in the parable of the dragnet, we have the separate separating of the wicked from among the just. So if I ask you, what time period do you think the dragnet's going to involve? Yeah. Yeah. The end of the age. Because it's a similar parable. Remember, all these parables are dealing with the postponement period. So this is clearly talking about the end of the age. Remember how Matthew uses that phrase now this is when the disciples came to jesus just before he began to give them the olivet discourse in matthew 24 and they asked a question tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and the what the end of the age as we go further on in the olivet discourse does jesus give an indication as to the timing of this period in fact, he does. What's the timing? Say it, say it louder. After the abomination of desolation. The abomination, and when, what time period does the abomination of desolation happen? The tribulation, but I'm looking for prophecy. He says it right here, right? Daniel, right? And that's Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 12. So, Jesus is telling his disciples that the end of the age involved the 70th week of Daniel, which is also the tribulation period, which is also the time of Jacob's trouble. Something else that's similar, at the end of the age, we have the wheat and the tares and the dragnet. What happens? The wheat and the tares and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. With the dragnet, and cast them into the furnace of fire, there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Huh. Now, will they, they won't ever go through the, the judgment? They're already judged. No, they won't. No. Nope. Great white That's the great white So think of it this way. They're alive. The unsaved are alive. Right. right. And they're cast into hell, but they're not resurrected yet. They get resurrected at the great white right, throne judgment. judgment. Okay, right, gotcha. Right. And that's like a fire. Right. And then that goes in woods. Yes. We got it now. Hell. Okay. Definitely Good. Okay. So this is... I'm getting old. That's okay. That's okay. 
that's why I have these charts up here because it helps us visualize what's going on. So both of these parables, the wheat and the tares, refer to what time frame? The end of the age, which is also called tribulation period, seven, ye seven, seven, seven years, seven years, I can count, <laughs> right? Which is also called seventh week of Daniel, which is also called the time of Jacob's trouble. So both of these parables are clearly representing the end of the tribulation period. And we have here another chart. So we have the wheat and the tares at the end right here, right? Mm -hmm. So we're all, so what we've looked at so far, we have the parable of the sower here and the wheat and the tares here. So the parables we've looked at so far represent the beginning and the ending of what period? The postponement period. Great. Now, let's look at the parable of the mustard seed. I've really enjoyed preparing for this. This is, it's, the Word of God is so rich with things that we need to understand. Some of them we have to dig deep to figure them out, but not impossible at all. Except for Josh, all of us would be underneath the height of this weed, right? It's not actually a weed, it's an herb. What's interesting about this particular plant, this mustard seed, almost all commentaries and, and Bible encyclopedias and all Bible scholars believe it's one particular mustard plant. Brassica niger, that's the Latin name, just means that the seeds are, are black, but it's, it's used for two reasons. Uh, seeds are used for oil, and also as a spice, and also the, the plant. You know, the mustard greens are something that's edible. Uh, this happens to be, I believe, in California. So it's an invasive species to this country, but in the Middle East, it grew all over the place. And the disciples would have known exactly what Jesus is talking about. So let's read, beginning in verse 31 of Matthew, and I'll read through verse 32. And another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. How many seeds is he talking about? That's different than the other parable, where there's lots of seeds. Now we're talking about just one seed. It's like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it becomes greater than the herbs. Herbs. I got a neighbor named Herb. I don't know why I say that. And becomes a tree so that birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So let's try to figure out some things regarding observation about these two verses we've just looked at. A man sowed. What did he sow? Little, tiny mustard seed. And what comes from that little, tiny mustard seed? A large plant, very large plant. It's large enough that what can land in it? Birds. I happen to like birds. I watch birds. Birds can land in trees, but they can also land in, on weeds that are pretty big. Right? Some facts that we need to, I think, are helpful for us to understand regarding, whoops. I wanted to go one more. Look how small those seeds are. That's someone's hand if you couldn't figure it out. You can see their handprints. Those t seeds are tiny. They're tiny. And what Jesus is putting forth is a man goes out and he, he sows one of these tiny little seeds. And a huge plant comes from it. So some, some basic facts about this plant. I already told you what it is. That's a particular species of plant. But here's something about that plant. It's an annual plant. Will that, should that make a difference in our understanding? It's not like a tree that grows and grows and grows and grows for a long period of time. This is a tiny seed. It grows really fast in a short period of time. The seeds are used for oil. The plant is used in an herb. And again, rapid growth, tiny seed produces a large annual plant. I don't think we can, I don't think we should 
sidestep any of this information the disciples would have known just by having this plant as part of their life. I think it suggests rapid growth in a short period of time. Now we know this parable is describing the postponement period, but what part of the period? I want you to think about this. Do you think the parable of the mustard seed, that one individual seed, this tiny little seed that grows really fast from, and it produces an annual plant, is it representing the whole period of the postponement period? Including the latter part of Jesus' earthly ministry, the church age, all the way through the seven-year tribulation period? Some things I've been chewing on. To the present day, this is how long the church age has been going on. 1,994 years, approximately. <coughs> if you add on the tail end of Jesus' earthly ministry, we're pretty close to 2,000 years into the postponement period. And I'm going to ask you a question. Does that seem like really fast growth in a short period of time? Has there been fast growth? There have been times of fast there growth. Been in the, periods, but not fast. Yes, in the early in the early part of the church, first century, we see times when thousands right. of people are coming and added to the church, right? But I'm not quite sure that this many years, almost 2,000 years now, represents this super fast period of growth that we see here in the parable of the mustard seed. We have an annual plant being described. We have something really, really tiny being described. I wonder what time period this could be referring to. I don't want you to think about something. We have the rapture right here. The moment the rapture takes place, Within one second, how many true believers are on the earth? Zero. Thank you, Andy. Wait a minute. I want you to think about that. There's not, the moment the rapture takes place, every true believer is where? Up with the Lord. That means on the earth, right here, I don't know if it's a nanosecond, a millisecond, or what, but there's going to be this moment of time when on the earth there's not one single believer. That's amazing, isn't it? Right. What's the truth? <clears throat> and I'm not saying, let's, I'll put it this way, let's say that the rapture happens, and I don't know this is true, but I'm just giving you an illustration. The rapture happens on a Sunday. And there's a preacher who's preaching about end times. And he's preaching about the rapture. And he gives a gospel message at the very end of his sermon. And as he doesn't even get to say amen when he's closing in prayer. <clears throat> the rapture takes place and there's several unbelievers in the pews. This is just an illustration. Could be cool though. <laughs> it's possible that some of those we could save right away. Or at least be thinking really hard. I don't know what just happened here, but that message is seeming to really come alive right now. But we know the scripture talks about the two witnesses in Revelation 11, 3 through 4. And I believe they're Moses and Elijah, right? Did God use them in a mighty way in the past? And he's going to use them in a mighty way in the future. And right after their ministry, we see another group of people. Who are these people? Jews. And these are Jewish people. 144,000 are Jewish people. And what are they doing? Apparently, they're proclaiming the gospel like crazy because we see shortly after the mention of 144,000 in Revelation 7 9, a great multitude which no man could what? Number. 
They could, they could count them, they could number them. That's how many there are. And then we have, we have this reminder in Matthew 24, and this, this is the end times, the end of the age, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And what's also incredible, we have in Revelation 14, an angel preaching the everlasting gospel. Now I want you to think about the tiny, tiny mustard seed that's an annual plant that grows really, really fast in one year. Is it possible that this is the short time period that grows like no other time period in the postponement period? You see what I'm saying? I think it's very likely that the parable of the mustard seed refers to this time. And there's other reasons that I would think this is true. The disciples certainly would have understood the 70 weeks of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel. Jesus mentions it in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet. So it's very possible that this fast growth with one seed, and it is interesting to think, there'll be that first individual who's saved in the seventh week of Daniel. Because in the beginning, there's not one person saved, but someone is going to be that first person saved. Whether they're the seed, I don't know. And I don't want to read too much into this parable, but certainly it seems to me this could be a possible explanation for this parable of the mustard seed. And how fascinating it is to see an angel involved in preaching this everlasting, or the gospel that will be preached in this time period. Let me just, in closing, just say this. This is week number six. Seems like a lot, right? What do we do the first two Sundays? We looked at chapter 11 and chapter 12, and we look also at other chapters within Matthew that dealt with the rejection period. And we didn't even move on to Matthew 13 that deals with the parables about the postponement of the kingdom until we understood the context of Matthew chapter 11 and 12. We even did a little in Matthew 10. But what typically happens is someone will come in and they'll just look with, a, with I call it tunnel vision, they'll look just at the verses that deal with one parable in Matthew 13 and that's all they're looking at and they don't even look at or explain the context and then all of a sudden, if you, if I had taught you the context and then went, ast went astray from the context when I was, and I should have done that as a trick, uh, in, the, in the parables, some of you would have been saying, wait a minute, Mr. Button, that's not what the context says, and that's what we're learning here.